this is a really broad question, but it's kind of the first question is, uh, what is Desert Oracle? Explain this to the people that don't know about it. Sure. Desert Oracle is a regional publication, a periodical that currently looks like this. And it's kind of a pocket-sized book about the mythology, the folklore, the flora and fauna of our American Southwestern deserts. Now, I'm in the same desert you're in. We're in the Mojave. So we do pay a little special attention to the Mojave. But we also cover the Sonoran Desert, which is where Arizona is, uh, the Great Basin, which is northern Nevada, and uh, the Colorado Desert and the Chihuahuan Desert, which is West Texas. And the desert is just filled with weird characters, strange history, outlandish schemes, uh, magicians, UFOs, monsters. To me, it's just the most interesting place in the world. And it's all just out in our public lands, our backyards, wherever we live in the Southwest. What... What do you think it is about the, the desert that it builds that sort of character? I mean, it, it, it's almost, uh, you drive through a, a small desert town in Arizona and you drive through a small untouched desert town in California, which they're running out of those. And you drive through a small desert town in, in Nevada and there's just a, the same kind of feeling, the same kind of character born there, it seems like. And it, it molds people in a sense. And it's global. Uh, there's a, a long tradition of artists, philosophers, magicians, prophets, priestesses, oracles going out into the desert wilderness to get that, that still, quiet, unpeopled space where you can communicate with the divine. You can, you can reach the parts of us that are old and ancient and still there. And in our time, we tend to think that we've lost that. We've been in a period of, of disenchantment, as um, Max Weber, the philosopher, described it, this idea that since the Industrial Revolution, we've sort of smashed out the magic and the soul from life. And there's no place for that anymore because now it's, you know, science and whatnot. And, but the, the human soul requires the mystical stuff. So no matter how much you have somebody telling you on Twitter or something, you have to listen to science. There's a part of us that says, well, science is great, but we need magic too. And you need to get away from the hustle and bustle. You know, Jesus did it. Buddha did it. They had to get out of town and go out to the wilderness on the edge of town to be able to get in touch with themselves. George O'Keefe did it at the Ghost Ranch in, in New Mexico. So there's, in the desert in particular, it's very stark. It's extreme. And it kind of, we shrink into that environment when we're alone. Like you talked about driving on the highway in the desert, it's just you in this little box rolling down the road and you feel the immensity of the world around you. Whenever I think of the desert, I think, I don't think of, um, I, like, I see the life of the desert. I see the things that are out there. But I think a lot of people these days and I think more and more are discovering it, but so many people see it as a wasteland. I think they're missing something. Oh yeah. Yeah, the, the old idea that there's nothing there uh, has happily for a lot of us turned into the, the nothingness holds these great mysteries and this great beauty and where there might be to someone who would only describe a, uh, a beautiful natural scene is being very green and filled with things. The minimalism of the desert is something I think that appeals both to our ancient selves and our modern selves. You know, like uh, Lawrence of Arabia said, they asked him, uh, what do you like about the desert? And he said, it's clean. 
it's and it, it's like a, a a minimalist canvas. Yeah, um, the uh, back to Desert Oracle, uh, you talk about minimalist. Um, what where did you get that? the idea to, to do something like that, to put out a, a, a small book, a regular publication, and it's minimal. I mean, there's, it's, it's beautiful, it's artistic, but it is minimal. Yeah, it's, uh, when I was a kid driving around the national parks, the Bureau of Land Management, wild areas, the East Mojave, which is now Mojave National Preserve between um, Baker and, and uh, Prim. Uh, that was one of my favorite places to ramble around when I was a kid in my old international scout. And I'd pick up these little booklets, these booklets that would be made by, by local printers. And the booklets would be things like uh, Death Valley Jeep Trails or lost mining camps of the Eastern Sierra or um, cemeteries on America's loneliest road on the 50 in Nevada. And they all kind of looked the same. They were, they were small, kind of like the size of old maps that you'd put in your map box. And so you could put them in your pocket. And because they were cheaply made, they'd be printed in one color inside, just black, black and white, illustrations, black ink on white paper. But to spruce it up, they'd use colored stock for the cover pages. And that colored stock would invariably be yellow or orange. And that's how you knew it was a desert book. And so these things you could find, every, there's still some of them in print. You can go to a, a gift shop at a national park or something, and you, you'll see some things like this. And they're all like copyright 1972 or 1961 or whatnot. And I love the look of those things. I love the simplicity of it. I love the focus of it. And now that anybody can print like some four color brochure on their computer and have it uh, shipped to your house from uh, online printer or pick it up at the, the copy shop with the most elaborate gaudy color and everything. I like the idea of getting rid of that because there's color on everything. You know, there's color on our phones, on our TVs, and you get that sort of stark feeling by stripping it down a bit. And you can carry it in your pocket. You know, Desert Oracle, I, I size, it's got a weird trim size. And if you wear Levi's or Wranglers or whatever, put it in your back pocket. It fits exactly. It will not fall out on the trail. I'll remember that. So, and, and it also won't, you know, won't hurt the edges. Uh, so we, we tried to do that in the, in, in the book as well uh, to replicate those aspects of it, but also make it look like something more, more permanent. And the size I found is also kind of useful because by mail, when you get it, it comes in a greeting card or invitation sized envelope. So it's like you're getting a present. Even if you're not consciously thinking about it, that's the size, the A7 envelope. So you take that out. It's like, ah, oh, Desert is not a bill from the insurance company. <laughs> Thank God, you know. It's uh, it's not a collection agency. It's, it's something nice. It's not trying to sell me anything. I already bought it. Um, I, I recently you were featured in a Guardian article. Has there been quite a response for you on that? I mean, it was a really good article. There, there has been a nice response to that. Uh, it's when you're one person doing something, if 10 people notice it's, you know, a nice response because you get some emails um, or a, you know, a like on Instagram or something. And when you have, one thing it does is it sort of puts rest to the idea that, that nobody reads newspapers anymore. Because whether you're reading it online, and that's how most people read The Guardian in the US is online, there's a lot of people reading it. And that thing came out, I don't know, my phone started going nuts at about five in the morning last week or early this week, I had the same week, yeah. Um, and I didn't know what day it was coming out. And so, you know, first you think, I don't know what's wrong, more 
coronavirus <laughs> alerts or something. And a, a, it, a lot of people read it. Uh, some people like it because they already get it. They already subscribe or they listen to my radio show or the podcast and they're, you know, they're, so it's kind of like, yay, home team. And they'll spread it around. But you hear from, you hear from people who never heard of the thing at all. You know, you, you have that, I'm sure. And your work, you get used to people know what the station is. They know what you do. But now and then you run across somebody and they're like, what? I don't have a TV. <laughs> and so, yeah. so it's, it's nice. And they say there's no bad press, but a article by somebody who took the time, you know, the, the, the writer Dominic came out here and spent the day with me. He's like the first person I saw in a long time. <laughs> I, I wanted him to stay. <laughs> Could you be my friend? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so he did it. He, he understands it. He gets it. He'd been out here before and he's, he's a, a good writer. So it was a real treat. How are you going to keep up with demand? I mean, you, I go every time I've been on your website, the back issues are almost always gone. Yeah. Are you, are you planning on upscaling? Or are you just going to keep it uh, at a low number? What do you think? Um, well, the book. This is this is the 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 hardcover. Um, this was part of the solution. So when I went out talking to publishers, part of it was people always want the back issues, but it costs me as much as a, a small publisher to reprint an old issue as to make a new issue. So economically, I, I can't really reprint those old issues. But if I kind of pick and choose from them and then we put out books, then I get somebody else to pay for the printing, the publisher, and then I get different distribution. Uh, we get the distribution of, of a real publisher you can only buy Desert Oracle, the publication, in probably 30 shops, I think. And they're all places that I went in there. You know, some I do not know how to sell anything. And I just kind of walk in and I, I have these. I publish them locally. What do you think? And most people are like, no, go away. Um, but now and then you get a retailer and they've become, especially around Joshua Tree, the, the places where people kind of, you know, we're here in town, we're going to go to such and such a little bookstore or a little gallery or shop and they've got them. And then it feels kind of secret. So it'd be nice to find a balance between those because the problem with being secret, like you know, old uh, independent or alternative or punk groups or when, when I was a kid, you'd always think they're trying to hide it to keep the squares, you know, from finding it. But that wasn't it. They just can't find distribution. So when you can't find distribution, you have a more limited audience, but sometimes it sort of helps make a, a cult audience because people feel like they're invested a little bit more in it. Uh, so I would, I've had, I've had trouble keeping to a quarterly publication schedule, like a lot of trouble because especially since starting the radio show and the podcast, it's still just me. I have I have help one day a week on mailing out subscriptions. Um, otherwise, whether it's you know, doing the bookkeeping or uh, trying to fix the internet when it goes out right before I'm about to talk to you, it's I don't have anybody else to blame. I got to do everything. So uh, it would it if I could, I would hire out a little editorial help so that the magazines come right on time. That would be the main thing I'd change, I guess. There seems to be also a varied myths of the desert, varied mysteries from all over. There's always a, a serpent living in a lake or, or a, a miner who stashed away in a mine and lived there for a long time, or an Indian who would drop down from the canyon walls and, and murder 
you know, miners along the Colorado River. You know, there's always these stories and the mysteries. Like, how how does it maintain that? Like, how do the mysteries continue to to remain mysteries? It's a, it's kind of amazing some of the things that and some of the stories that you've had in, in Desert Oracle cover a lot of that. Yeah, well, as time goes by, things get foggier and mythologies, modern mythologies. I mean, now we use mythology to mean kind of a, a, a poetic telling of a semi-factual story. Mythologies used to just be belief, religion. Um, but as, as we, in, in our modern era where we think we can look up anything and find the answer, there's a lot of stuff that there just aren't any answers to. There's a lot of real mysteries. People have been looking for the, the cities of gold in the Southwest for 500 years. And even though there's not much evidence that there ever was a city of gold, it doesn't stop people from looking for them. Sometimes the things that people are looking for will emerge in new forms. So there were ghost ships in the California desert in the area of the Colorado uh, desert between Anza Borrego and the Colorado River in Yuma, where the sand dunes are. And there were tales for many, many, well, over a century of ships that would emerge when the sand dunes would blow this way or that way, and they were filled with treasure. Then in the 1990s, a ship started appearing again in the Imperial Sand Dunes down there in Imperial County. And it was the set from the Star Wars movie, Return of the Jedi. There's a, uh, like a sand barge that uh, um, Jabba the Hutt, the, the, the Star Wars gangster, and they shot, you know, they, they didn't have CGI to make that sort of stuff then. It was a real physical thing that dozens of people were on and they left it and it was buried by the dunes before they could come back and tear it all down like they were supposed to, like they promised the Bureau of Land Management that they would do. So a new ghost ship started appearing <laughs> and it took a while to figure out, well, that ghost ship was actually put there as part of a space mythology movie. But in a hundred years, when it shows up again, People may not know. People may connect it to ghost ships from uh, the Spanish conquest. That's funny. That's good. Ghost ships. Yeah. There's a there's a missing uh, whiskey wagon that's supposedly buried in the big dunes up in Amargosa Valley. A, oh, yeah. Uh, I'd like would, to find that. That whiskey would be very good by now. Yeah. George, George and I have talked about trying to find that for a long time on the long trips across that that desert. <laughs> well, speaking of George, he uh, told me about something I'd never heard about, which is the Mojave megaphone. Right. Yeah. This is a thing that has been there for many years and there's no explanation for it. There's theories, of course. Some people think it's an art project like the monoliths that are popping up everywhere now. Some people think it was part of a uh, public safety kind of announcement system. You attach an air horn to it in case chemicals spilled out. And it doesn't make much sense, but it's up there and it's become something you make a pilgrimage to. So the, oh, there's another one, Owens Dry Lake. There were steamboats that worked Owens Lake before it became dry, before Los Angeles took the water uh, in the aqueduct. And one of these steamboats crashed and it hit, hit, uh, I forget what happened to it. There's some different stories, but there was a silver mine on the other side. So there's a persistent legend that there are these silver bars at the bottom of a wrecked steamship at the at Owens Dry Lake, which you know, when you drive by Owens Dry Lake, it's just a playa. There's, so maybe it's somewhere under there. And sure. now they're talking about refilling the lake. So maybe when the lake fills up again, it'll emerge. Yeah. And we can get rich. 